This is a Digital Music Trends episode 130 recorded on the 1st of May 2013. This week, a news roundup and a number of interviews recorded at the Future Music Camp. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show where we cover the latest news in the digital music space. DMT is available well pretty much everywhere as an audio and video show on the Apple Podcast app. Most podcatchers including Dogcatcher for Android and Downcast for iOS, which by the way is a pretty great app so you should check it out. YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Mixcloud, TuneIn Radio and more. This week on DMT a quick news round and then interviews uh, with BMW on music apps in the car, actually recorded in a car Top Gear style. Universal Universal Music on Modern a r Odyssey Music Network on Modern Management, and a new startup called Endor Me. And all of these were recorded at the Future Music Camp in Mannheim just last weekend, uh, which is a great conference uh, that the Pop Academy puts together there. Uh, so May and June are certainly pretty busy events-wise, uh, so Digital Music Trends is going to be at Liverpool Sound City starting tomorrow, and then uh, there's going to be uh, Digital Shortage, Music Tech Fest, uh, and the World Creators Summit in Washington, which is going to be quite exciting. And uh, I'm going to bring cover from all of these events uh, on digitalmusictrends.com so make sure you check the site for that and uh, now let's move on to the quick news round on what's happened in the digital music space uh, this week before we head on to the interview section of the show First of all, Series XM has announced a pretty great quarter with revenue up 12% year on year at $897 million. Even if it did fall short of analyst expectations, which were hoping for about $906 million. Also, the company confirmed James E. Mayer in the role of CEO. He'd been interim CEO for the past four months, so he was confirmed. And uh, um, at the same time, the company posted profits of $124 million for Q1, which is for me is the most interesting part uh, from a in- music industry standpoint. Also because I think this is a figure that is going to be banded around quite a bit in the next few months as the debate for internet radio streaming rate rages on. So of course, uh, if Pandora was to propose a new bill, uh, you know, it would certainly point to these profit margins by Series XM to show the unfairness of their situation for having to pay such higher rates for internet uh, radio streaming. And also I think that musicians organizations and the collection societies will also be looking at the profit margins of Series XM uh, to uh, show that uh, they think they should be getting a higher rate uh, from the satellite uh, radio company. <laughs> Moving on, uh, Twitter Music had a a fairly bad week uh, as the app uh, uh, Twitter uh, hashtag music failed to gain momentum on the iTunes store. So the app, when it came out, debuted at number one in the music category and at number five in the overall free apps chart uh, in the US, of course. But it quickly fell to respectively number 11 and number 124 for the overall chart, or at least these were the figures a couple of hours ago when I checked. In the UK, it's doing even worse, uh, with the app not even appearing in the in the top 200 chart now, uh, at least uh, when I checked. Uh, and uh, it's only 34th in the free music apps section. So critics of the app pointed to the fact that you have to be a subscriber of either audio or Spotify to get a decent experience. And if you're not, then you, you're stuck with the samples that iTunes gives you, which are, I think, uh, 60 or 90 seconds. Uh, so not a great experience for the majority of your users that would have downloaded the app. And also it's a closed ecosystem. You have to go into the app to see what's what's happening over there. And uh, a lot of people pointed to the fact that it, it wasn't delivering fantastic recommendations to them. Uh, but as a premium subscriber of Spotify, I found myself going back to it, uh, you know, at least uh, once every couple of days to check what's happening on it. And uh, I think it could have a chance of bouncing back if they could enlist the free streaming platforms like Vivo and SoundCloud, for example. I think that would really uh, help in drawing in people that are not currently premium subscribers of uh, streaming music services, which at the moment is still the majority of people. Like, uh, let's face it, uh, they are gaining momentum, that, but the streaming services are not yet uh, totally mainstream. <laughs> And as the iTunes store turned 10 years old on the 28th of April, there were a lot, a lot of uh, great articles and great points of view on how iTunes changed the music industry forever, uh, their influence, their bad influence, their good influence, what they did, what they didn't do, uh, a lot of uh, points of view on this. uh, So I'm not really going to get into it. I'm sure you can do a quick search on Google News for iTunes anniversary or uh, iTunes 10th anniversary and you'll find a lot of great uh, reads uh, uh, on that front. Uh, So, you know, uh, all I can say is that... uh, 
iTunes has been a constant in, in the landscape of ever-changing services. And although I almost never listen to my iTunes library anymore, uh, it's quite cool to be able to go back to music you were listening to seven or eight years ago that is actually still in your hard drive. And you can find all the random singles, bootlegs and guilty pleasures uh, on there. And they're still there, uh, which is an issue, of course, you know, with streaming services, you never know what's going to happen in seven, eight, ten years time if, 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 you, if you're still going to be able to access that information. And uh, moving on, uh, a bit of random uh, news on the crowdfunding front uh, as Amanda Palmer wrote an open letter to Morrissey this week uh, to try and enlist him to uh, uh, crowdfund his uh, newest record. Apparently she heard that he's having trouble finding a label for this release uh, um, and uh, she uh, proposed to him to uh, go to a crowdfunding platform which, which could be Pledge or Kickstarter. Of course, we all know how successful Amanda Palmer was on Kickstarter raising over a million dollars. And she also made some quick maths uh, saying that if half a million fans of Morrissey were to purchase uh, the digital uh, version of the record at $5 each, that would be $2.5 million, which would easily market, you know, provide for a marketing campaign and for a release, uh, release funds uh, for the record. And uh, being a digital release, it wouldn't have any postage costs. And so Morrissey could actually take back a fair chunk of money from that. Uh, so that's an interesting notion. And it's going to be interesting to see whether Morrissey responds to uh, that. I mean, the only problem that I can see in this is that Morrissey doesn't have a very strong social media presence. I think I checked his Twitter account and he didn't uh, tweet anything since 2009 and only has 57,000 followers. Uh, but he does have a fairly healthy uh, Facebook presence with almost a million uh, likes on there. So maybe that could be a platform where he can launch the campaign from. But also I'm sure that if he did something on crowdfunding, it would be covered extensively in mainstream press. So probably that would be enough to get his fans to realize what's what's happening and we all know how uh, strongly Morris's fans feel about him uh, I mean I've, I've worked in an office with one and if you know one or are one you know uh, how much uh, they, they love him and how much uh, you know they would be prepared to uh, potentially spend that money to make the campaign happen and and I think probably a lot more than five dollars as well here in the UK, the BPI announced that uh, 2012 saw a 7.2% increase in the sale of compilations uh, that reached uh, 20.6 million units. Uh, also in Q1 of 2013, the increase was even bigger, and so there was an 11.8% increase over the previous year. So that indicates that there's a room for further growth in this segment. Uh, the Now That's What I Called Music series especially uh, saw 2.9 million sales across its uh, three titles, and that represents an 11-year high for the popular compilation. So digital uh, is playing an important part in these numbers, uh, increasing its market share over physical products by 7.2% year over year, and it's now 23.5%. The digital side is even more rosy if we look at the sales of one of the most popular compilations, which was uh, now that's what I call Christmas, where it represented 48% of all sales. And probably that's also because uh, now that's what I call Christmas is a very timed compilation you know I can imagine a lot of people wanting to get hold of it just a few days before Christmas or uh, on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day and not wanting to take a chance on whether it would arrive on time so they would just get it uh, digitally which makes sense <laughs> And uh, finally, Shazam announced a high-level shakeup as uh, Rich O'Reilly uh, was brought in as the new CEO of the company this week. The former EVP Americas for Yahoo said, I look forward to extending our dominance in media engagement from our roots in music uh, to our leadership position in second screen TV and want to ensure that Shazam is the company that helps people recognize and engage with the world around them. Andrew Fisher, CEO since 2005, will become a full-time full executive chairman focusing on the development and strategy of the company and Shazam also aims to deliver a successful IPO to its shareholder, shareholders although we've all seen how the latest uh, few tech IPOs have gone so I'm sure they will be treading carefully on that one. Uh, as a company Shazam has every reason to be positive about its future and revealed reaching 60 million monthly active users with 2 million more added every week. Uh, Shazam's expansion plans of course have, have a lot to do with the TV market as uh, uh, the, the Shazam TV service now covers all US nationwide programming and also also, the TV advertising program is, uh, is doing very well for them, too. 
but that's all for this uh, news flash uh, that I put together for this week uh, given that I had so many interviews to put out as well and uh, now it's time for DMT's interviews at Future Music Camp I really hope you enjoy them I think there are some of the topics are quite fascinating and address both global concerns and issues uh, specific to Germany uh, next week uh, the show is going to go on as usual I might have a couple of interviews from Liverpool Sound City but uh, we're going to have a regular show with the panel and commenting on the week's news <laughs> Okay, it's uh, great to be here at the Future Music Camp uh, with uh, Peter Bergner, uh, product manager at the Entertainment and Music Apps Division at uh, BMW. So hi Peter, and how's it going today? Hi, it's going great, although it's raining again, but it's, it's been a great day. And yeah. so t tell me all about sort of uh, what we're seeing here, w w what's, what's the latest at BMW in terms of music and audio in the car? Yeah, so we are demoing here um, BMW apps. Um, which is um, which allows applications that you have on your phone uh, to to, con uh, to connect to your car, yeah. and we've recently allowed, uh, announced four four new apps. Um, so I'm currently running OPO, which we launched last year, yeah. but we've just announced um, TuneIn, uh, Rhapsody, right. Audible, and and Klimps. Um So I could go in uh, into TuneIn. Um, I click on TuneIn. The application will be launched. Again, this 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 isn't yet out, so it will be available very soon. Um, so we are seeing here a prototype right now. Yeah. So you can see on the phone that the application is connected to the car. Yeah. Um, it resumes in the car's um, display. Um, so the playback resumes where you last le left off um, your phone. Um, I'm listening to my favorite Spanish radio station here. Um, I can control, that, uh, control it uh, fully with the iDrive e controller here. Yeah. Uh, I can also use the steering wheel buttons and it's even being projected into the windscreen uh, with a head-up display. Yeah. So I can even see um, the radio station there and I can even uh, skip to the next radio station um, with the information there in the in the windscreen. Yeah, that's right. And so the, 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 and the, and the app that you're showing me here is connected to the uh, car by Bluetooth, right? Uh, no, it's connected over over um, that wide Apple cable right now. Okay, cool. um, we also have special adapters, um, step-in adapters, where you can safely put your phone away, and then it also has access to the exterior antenna. Um, but like this is um, that's the typical way that you could just connect it over the wide well, Apple awesome. iPhone cable. Yeah, I didn't know that you could ha have added functionality by doing that. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, in terms of connectivity, um, how are you finding the experience uh, of streaming? Because, of course, you know, one of the big worries that people have when, when you talk about streaming music in the car is the fact that you're not going to have connection all the time. So, yeah. uh, how is how how is that side of it? How how are you working on that? Yeah. So we try to optimize it as best as we can. So obviously, if you have no internet connection at all, um, then you just can yeah. listen what you've downloaded before. Um, right now, this is TuneIn. Um, so in TuneIn, we have a functionality called Time Shift. So we could uh, simply skip back a title and listen to that title again. So if we have no reception, for example. Um, if we use other applications like Pandora in the US or OPO, um, in those radio-ish applications, um, we try to cache uh, songs ahead. So even when you are in a bad, uh, in an area with poor reception, you still have access to your great music. That's awesome, and, and so there's a, there's a little, little bit of caching as well involved, I guess, whilst your yeah. whilst the music is playing. So if you go through a tunnel, you still have those 10 seconds ahead that you can keep listening, and then it will catch up when when it reconnects. Uh, yes, exactly. Even though tunnels are interesting because tunnels are typically where you have the best reception, because people <laughs> want to want to be able to make phone calls there. So yeah. in tunnels, you'll always have great receptions while reception while FM typically doesn't work. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And so, uh, you know, looking at how the, this field is evolving, uh, of course, the biggest challenge that I, I hear from people that, that work in the car space is that uh, cars are designed a long time ahead. And so, uh, you know, the, the biggest problem that manufacturers have is that technology moves so quickly that the worry is that if you design a system, then it's going to be four years old by the time you take it to market. So how do you, how do you manage to avoid that? Yep. So what we did is we created that generic interface called BMW Apps, yeah. uh, which you find in the Connected Drive menu. Um, and you can uh, enable any, any application on the phone to connect to that interface. Um, so like this, we can retrofit new functionality even to old cars. 
So for example, we, we launched this interface in Mini already in 2010 and the new applications which we just announced like TuneIn Rhapsody, they work seamlessly also in those models. Yeah, sure. And uh, looking at how you uh, navigate from, because of course one of the biggest uh, concerns of people that use the systems is uh, uh, to make sure that they can operate them safely while they're driving. And so how do you sort of shift from one thing to the other while you're, for example, you know, navigating through a destination with a sat nav and then want to switch to the music? Is that a, a quite an easy process to do? Uh, yes, um, so you'll find all applications in that section. The interface is currently in German, but it reads yeah. um, further apps or more apps uh, in English. So if you click on that, you find all the compatible apps that I currently have on my phone. Okay. And I can just switch uh, to Rhapsody with one click or to uh, Facebook or Calendar or whatever functionality I currently might want to use. Awesome. So, so sorry, I, I, think, I think I got this. Uh, um, I, I've been confused about it. So basically, the system can see what apps you have installed on your phone, and then interfaces with them, and so essentially takes the information from from your the app on your phone into the into the system, right? Well, you need to have one application connected to the car, yeah. and that one application identifies all other applications awesome. and That's loads great. them into the car's head unit. That's really cool because it basically future proofs the interface as well to be able to add yeah. more stuff into it because that, that's the main concern of people that are like you know if I have this system what, what's gonna happen how, how is it gonna how is it gonna work and and the other thing I want to ask about um, is how do you because of course this system is going to be updated re relatively regularly mm -hmm. and so how does BMW go about making sure that the drivers have the most up-to-date version of the firmware on the car without you know too much hassle isn't it? Well, the cool thing is you actually don't need to change anything in the car. So even the old uh, cars from 2010 would work with new applications. So the only thing you really, as a client, need to worry about is to get the application that are compatible um, with your car. Okay. So I can, can just, in the future, when Rhapsody is, is launched, I can just download my, rec my, my regular um, Rhapsody application in the iTunes store, and that application will work with any Mini and BMW with that option. Right, so you don't have to like take the car to a dealer and get the upgrade done on the car. Yeah, exactly. No, no need to go to the dealer, just download your new application on the phone and you're all set. That's awesome. Well, that's great. And uh, so how, how do you feel like the, this field is going to progress? Because of course uh, a lot of people are putting their chips in the, in the car market because it's, uh, it's going to be a huge part of how streaming evolves. Uh, we've seen Pandora expand a lot in the US in, in, the, in, the, in that field. Uh, so how, how do you see the, like, the next sort of a couple of years uh, fleshing out on that? Do you, do you see a lot more apps coming in and, and a lot more services uh, getting into the space? Uh, yes, definitely. So we see great interest from, from all partners uh, to be uh, available in the car. So we expect many more applications uh, available in, in the car in the future. That's awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Great, so I'm here with Julian Kern, uh, the a and manager at Pop Progressive at Universal Music. So hi Julian, it's good to have you on, how's it going? Yeah, very good, very good, how are you doing? <laughs> great, thank you, it's, uh, it's good to be here at Future Music Camp in Mannheim. And so uh, you did a really cool, great presentation this morning on sort of the, the challenges and, and the new uh, ways of modern a &R. So let's start by talking about that. Uh, you know, what has really, what, what would you say is the most significant thing that has changed in a &R in the last uh, five years? Okay, so it's, uh, first of all, it's, uh, um, more <laughs> it's just um, it's internationally uh, through the internet it's uh, so it's not focusing on one territory anymore it's just uh, the whole world and then it's just a lot so um, you, you have to handle kind of all the all the ways um, that you that you uh, can use like Facebook and all the all the blog blogosphere and um, so the, yeah to find a way I think that's 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 what changed to find your own way and um, also to to handle that and still use the um, classic traditional media like radio and TV um, and um, yeah so um, especially the way to distribute music um, um, and it's um, also uh, I think by now more focus on life um, so that's that's what's what's ch like the main main changes and especially I think when it comes to credible acts um, I think that that is far more important by now it's it's not that I can as an A&R can like build or uh, create an act anymore really it's like more dependent on the act itself yeah. that, you know yeah, sure. yeah. and uh, I guess w w the first part of the a and process of course uh, uh, the actual discovery of the artist uh, yeah. is uh, 
some people would say that for uh, a person that would work uh, works at a major label, for example, has become easier just because it's easier to spot artists that are really gaining traction and then doing very well. Uh, on the other side, there's also still you know artists that are built from the ground up by by major labels. So, how do you see that sort of happening? Because it's kind of a, a binary way. You know, on the one side, you can find unknown artists and craft, you know, work with them, develop them, yeah. and, and launch them. And the, on the other side, of course, it's a much easier route of picking artists that are already fairly successful on their own rights. Yeah, I think for me it's both. Um, I think the, the still the main tool to, to discover acts is still very traditional, your own personal network. I think that's like the most important thing um, to build that network and to, to, to gain um, from that. Um, like you know have tips from managers from lawyers um, etc et bookers um, but um, the internet uh, makes it more easy to find good acts uh, the only question is um, are these acts really potentially mainstream acts that, that I can really sell um, um, a lot of CDs um, from or like music uh, because CDs aren't yeah uh, it's, it's still it's still important in it's Germany but it's um, which is good for us but um, yeah but, but really to tra uh, transform those like um, online acts into um, really mainstream acts that's I think that's always the first question for an act that you find in the blogosphere um, but for me it's I think 50-50 I mean I, demo wise it's I think uh, is less than 1% of acts that you find through that but um, sometimes you do and um, I still like very much to discover acts by myself um, and look for acts um, and um, it happens that I find those acts by myself um, and just build them from the ground um, up. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the role of A&R has, uh, has evolved a lot in the last few years also as far as uh, the duties, of course. People you know, in the mainstream might just think of A&R as the people that go to gigs and find acts, but there's a, there's a whole process. Basically, you manage the whole process of, of, of the release from, from finding the act to actually getting this, the release successfully out and, and uh, managing, uh, helping with the promotion and, and all that. So how much... Um, of the, for example, uh, social media part and, 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 and that falls in, in the realm of the A&R because, of course, you're kind of caught between management that deals with part of it and the digital side of the labels that deals with part of it. And so, but A&R still plays a part in that, right? Yeah, um, I think that differs from A&R to A&R. There are A&Rs, um, also colleagues of mine, that um, just focus on the <laughs> musical product and on creating um, the album um, and then finish it and then uh, give it over to the team. Um, but um, from my side, um, personally, because if I sign an act, um, I uh, need to have a vision for myself. I want to have that. I, I want to have a plan of how to develop the act. And so I need to be involved in kind of mostly every step. Um, so it's about the, the videos, very important. Um, I mean, if you as an A&R uh, record the, or produce the, the music together with the act, and then the video is just you know done by someone um, and is completely uh, it completely differs from what your vision is then it goes and you know maybe in the wrong direction so you need to be on that um, then it's about life is a very um, important um, aspect to to maybe also take care of you know the booking agency and and where to play and um, um, concentrate on that and then um, um, all the other tools um, maybe even create tools together with the act to break it um, I think that's also some something that I could you know be a part of of, um, to have ideas, you know, and, and um, it always it's always great if you have a great management or great product manager or online uh, promoter, sure, but um, still I think um, as an A&R you're very much uh, deeply, um, you know, um, into that um, creative process along the whole way. Yeah. 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 Of course, and it's a uh, so it's it's become much more of a co collaborative process at this point to, uh, between all the different parties that are involved in the release. Whilst before maybe it was more compart compartmentalized and everybody did their own job and kind everyone of got on with knew it. What to do, you know? Uh, and by now it's not that everyone knows what to do anymore. It, it's it's changing so quickly. Everything is changing. Um, yeah, like you know, see um, uh, Spotify, SoundCloud, whatever, um, and and the whole music video itself. You know how it changes and what people want and what people want to share and what people want to buy so um, everyone needs to adapt very quickly and um, so I try to to, to do that and um, yeah, yeah. And uh, do you think like something like, for example, 
uh, the Spotify new the new artist uh, sort of pages that they've just uh, just released uh, that that's going to go some way towards helping artists and and uh, fans to connect to those artists as well because uh, we saw yesterday the presentation here by uh, the Spotify team that showed you know how they want this to work which is you know the artist maybe adds a track or shares a track that they like and that pops up on the application for the fan to, to share. Are you excited about that? Yeah, I think um, the, the um, one, one, one important thing is that um, how you um, also see yourself um, the success of an act. So um, in, the, in the past years um, the success was only measured by sales and um, by now it has changed. Um, I think for me it has changed that I also um, see a success if an act is um, successful successful life um, especially or successful on Spotify or you know um, and so because we want to create an, a career you know it's it's long term and so um, there are acts out there that don't sell that much but I can see that with the second or third album it's gonna work out um, and so that's that's what I need to create and it's not so much about only sales anymore it's about really to bring an act uh, to an audience to create an audience and um, to develop a trademark you know and and then that that has changed so um, also regarding Spotify for me it's great if an um, act gets heard and um, um, there are more possibilities by now to get to get listened to and um, and Spotify is one and if you really you know uh, indulge with your fans there it's great it's a great tool and um, so I, I will watch this um, very closely and I think everyone is watching this I think e iTunes is watching it <laughs> the closest so it's very very <laughs> pink, it's yeah, faster, yeah it's very interesting um, how Spotify will develop and um, um, I, I didn't look so much by now into um, the, the yeah. turnover <laughs> So, yeah, it's very early days, so it's, I'm very excited and interested um, also what, what Spotify will, um, uh, will develop there. And so um, um, everything that helps my act to be heard um, is great. So. Yeah, of course, uh, talking about the German market, uh, of course, uh, talking with international labels like in the UK and in the US, a, a huge part of the strategy revolves around, especially for major labels, YouTube and, and, and Vivo in particular. And so how hard is it not having uh, those services fully available in Germany? Uh, is, it a, is it a big challenge for you? It's, sometimes it is a challenge. I think uh, one uh, important thing that uh, Germany doesn't, didn't understand until now is that, for example, we um, we don't have um, an international platform. We lose our international platform for our German acts also um, if we lose YouTube. You know, if we can't use YouTube, um, no one will also um, listen to it also in other territories. Also, that's the case because that's something that I was uh, I was uh, talking to somebody about yesterday, and I was thinking. So wait a minute, if, if a German act is blocked in Germany, no, it's, no, no, it's no. the other way around. Uh, because we know that uh, we can't use YouTube to a certain extent, we don't do it anymore. Uh, that's the thing right. so we, we work with other platforms but they are like German uh, platforms like my video de you know so um, who in America will turn to my video de to, to watch a video and that's just because of the whole YouTube discussion yeah. so if we would be able to to use uh, YouTube again more freely um, it would be um, um, you know uh, more international from the start that's one thing and the other thing is how we go around it yeah. is to use those YouTube channels for example I work with uh, with an hip hop act um, together with uh, with their indie label. So we yeah. signed them through the indie label, and so we can use the indie label channel um, on YouTube. Um, so it doesn't go through Universal directly, and that won't be um, how do you say. Um, um, cut off like Breaking, yeah, yeah. no no the, the, so YouTube can't or get the gamer can't, oh, can't, can't yeah, take, it, take it down take it down yeah, so exactly. um, yeah, yeah. so that there are ways around it that we know by now yeah but it's a bit it's a bit unfortunate to yeah. do, to have to go around yeah, of course it. and you know and, and nobody's uh, pointing fingers anywhere because uh, at the end of the day both sides have arguments that have merits yeah. so it's kind of like it's an interesting discussion that it's ongoing, but, but we'll see what happens with that. And finally, so uh, what, what are artists are, uh, to close, what artists are you excited about right now that you're working on and anything in particular that you want to do on a plug? Sure, there is um, a, a Munich act that is called Claire with a C, like the name Claire. Um, I'm very excited about that. It's, it's very cool. It's very um, internationally sounding. Every time I'm, I have it on my iPhone and every time it comes up, I'm thinking, wow, that's like uh, international sounding. Yes. And, um, and so, so I'm 
really excited about this. Um, uh, also, there's a Berlin uh, band called Abbey. They are from the Pop Academy, actually. Um, okay. um, originally, awesome. they built they built here, but uh, already seven years ago, uh, they came together here, and and uh, they are living in Berlin now. And um, about these young German acts, um, it's a special thing. They have a international sound. They have an international approach. They play in London for sold out shows. They have a, a London uh, UK, uh, promo agency or UK a promo agency. Also with Claire, it's the same thing. So we work a bit more internationally, um, and it and it uh, kind of reflects to Germany, you know, because we don't in Germany we don't have this big blogosphere. It's not so strong, you know. So we also don't have blog agencies like in the UK, and um, and so um, if we if we um, have a, a UK promo agency to work for our German acts, it will reflect uh, onto yeah. the German fans. So that's that's something that that that, that is very exciting. Those are like the two main acts and um, awesome. yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much Julian for your time and have a great day. Thank you, you too. Great, so we're here at the Future Music Camp 2013 and uh, it's the third time Digital Music Trends covers the event, which is great. And I'm here with uh, Ryan Rauscher, who is a project manager at Smix Lab, who, uh, uh, which is a, a project that works within the Pop Academy uh, uh, here in Mannheim. So hi Ryan, and great to have you on, on the show, how's it going? Um, yeah, good. And I actually feel like having two days of, of conference, uh, um, which we did. Um, yeah. But I feel uh, good, and it was um, a great weekend. Yeah. And um, yeah, thanks for having me again on, on the show. Uh, and the, the same, the same back to you. And uh, so, uh, talking about how the event is, is, has changed, uh, I think it's an interesting place to be. Uh, you know, in a university that deals with a lot of students because of course you you can be on the cutting edge of what's happening because you see what your students are doing and that's like a pretty good indicator of what what the latest trends are so uh, so how much of uh, of what what you organize comes from the students in the sense that it's trends that you go oh, okay i didn't realize this was happening and how much do you bring to your students uh, in terms of introducing them to new services that they that they might want to use yeah well actually that is one th one thing that has changed um we started last year to um you know, try to um, uh, relate or correlate more um, the what happens here at the Future Music Camp with uh, what students are writing in their theses. Um, uh, so um, they, for example, they can uh, or they have to make session um, submissions and and introduce sessions and host sessions at the Future Music Camp, um, and um, then they use that to uh, write their um, papers on it. Um, and of course, we always are looking for for um, you know company startups questions that people discuss here, and we try to you know forward that to students and see if um, that's interesting for them, and they can. Uh, you know, and do that, you know, more scientifically, maybe, yeah. and then, um, if it works out, bring it back uh, the next year to the camp. Yeah, sure. And uh, I remember, you know, was it like three or four, three years ago? Four years ago, that we uh, the first time I was here, and uh, Simfy was presenting, of course. Yeah. And yesterday we had a very, uh, you know, a flashy presentation on on the latest uh, stuff on Spotify with some stats uh, as well from uh, Willem uh, Tal, the band here in here in Germany. And so, you know, w w what is your feeling about uh, the adoption of Spotify here here in, in Germany, and also amongst your students, for example? Um, it's quite a lot. Um, um Spotify is um, is uh, doing very well in, in Germany. A lot of people are using it, and, and um, I see it in our studies. I do courses here at the Pop Academy as well, uh, and um, I can't say really in a percentage, but um, in the more digital um, topics and courses, there are like um, I would say 40% already using it, and um, I guess almost everybody knows about Spotify and what it is. Yeah, yeah sorry. That's right. And uh, so looking at the program for this year, uh, there were uh, you know, a few interesting uh, startups, uh, some established companies like, for example, SoundCloud, SoundCloud presented. And uh, uh, in terms of innovation here in Germany, uh, how, how do you feel about, for example, students getting into the business of producing new technology? And do you, f do you find a lot of ideas come from students when they have, for example, to submit business plans or anything for the, for the coursework? Yeah. Um, that I think um, interesting in that uh, respect is that we are educating people that are um, uh, sit between the traditional music industry and the um, technological sector. So um, um, 
We do have some student teams that are, um, you know, working on startups and business plans. Um, and, but right now we're trying to connect them more to um, computer science uh, students, to, uh, you know, business economics students and try to, you know, have teams with people from, from different fields. Because I think then it's, um, you know, more likely that it, um, something might work out. So we're doing projects um, together with uh, other, other universities or uh, research uh, institutions um, to try to make that connection and, and support our students in that way. Yeah, sure. And of course, if there's any educational institutions, I know I've, I've reached out to quite a few uh, that are suggesting the show to, to their students. So if anybody's listening that is interested in collaborating with the Pop Academy, I'm sure that you can you can find out more on, on, the, on the Pop Academy website. I'll, I'll drop a link in the show notes, of course, and, and find find out more, more about what they do and so uh, you know drawing a balance uh, how, how do you feel uh, the event went this year and uh, in, in terms of comparing it to, to, the, to the last years do you feel that there was a difference in, in the, the types of questions that were being asked also, also during the, the sessions and, and the focus maybe of, of the students on, on certain topics uh, other than others um, well um, first of all for, for the uh, event overall um, I'm I was satisfied to see, see what happened this year. We had 25% more registrations and, and wow. people come here. Um, and I think, or I actually have to say, I, I wasn't in uh, a lot of sessions because I had some things uh, to do. Of course, yeah. But I believe, um, you know, we're um, talking to students, trying to bring them to, to ask specific questions, you know. That's true, yeah. Uh, and not so much, you know, what is, really, what is happening to copyright, how can it be modernized, but really to go um, into detail and to try to focus on, 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 you know, one or two questions and trying to solve that and write a paper about that because I think that's, um, that's better than um, trying to, to, to solve, you know, the really big problems. Yeah, or big right. Because you, you, can, you can talk for hours about copyright at large, but if you focus on specific aspects of copyright, or yeah. you know, the, I see a session here like talking about the relevancy of charts and uh, you know something about just specifically WordPress and something yes, about the. That's what I want to say. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, a quite good example. We have some someone here uh, right now, I think, talking about uh, WordPress for musicians, and uh, he has um, services for that and technology, and um, so he's talking to students. You know, what what do they want? Um, how do they like what he's doing right now? So really, you know, down to earth discussions, what you can, well, what people and our participants can use, you know, from from tomorrow on. Yeah, great. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. And uh, uh, you can find all the interviews that are recorded here at Future Music Camp uh, on uh, digitalmusictrans.com. And if you're watching the, sh the long version of the show, you're probably going to be able to see them uh, just after or just before this interview. So thanks so much, Ryan, for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have you here for the third time, I, yeah. I think. And, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, the event is mostly in German, but we try to do as much as English. And um, everybody is invited in to, to come over and to um, talk about cooperation or um, present the company technologies and stuff so thank you very much great awesome thank you so I'm here at Future Music Camp with uh, Tobias uh, Shiwek uh, from uh, the company uh, Endor Me your founder and CEO so uh, how's it going today and uh, thanks for thanks for your time thank you very much for your time cool so uh, let's talk about the company uh, it's the first I heard of it uh, here at Future Music Camp so I'm really excited to know all about it uh, what do you guys do yeah, we're pretty much new. We, we just launched like six weeks ago. And uh, the first step how we launch is what we call the Flipboard for Entertainment. Yeah. So what we basically do is, for you as a fan, we take you all the stress to, to aggregate the relevant information regarding your artist. And relevance means, in, in both ways, relevance in, in terms of the artist himself. Like, is Shakira really the artist Shakira? Is it an animal? And uh, your personal relevance, like, you, you might be interested in releases, but not that much into live concerts. So uh, we provide both of it. This is why we call it Flipboard for Entertainment. And uh, as we get all the stress for you out of the business, we, we do the same for the artist. So we aggregate, again, traffic and relevance for the artist himself. And we just push back and forth the traffic that he needs to ticketing, to merchandise and stuff. That's the first step how we start. Uh, you don't need any active artist at this point. It's just aggregation. Awesome. And so uh, what, what, what uh, spurred you to start a company and what, you know, what, what did you see as a market need uh, to, to create a service? Uh, actually, the, the need comes from both sides. My, my co-founder Tim, he, he's very much into live concerts and he missed two times in a row his favorite artist playing in Cologne where we live. Um, just because he missed it, 
So, for instance, Facebook is not made to, to be, stay up to date with your artist. Uh, but on the other hand, artists uh, experience exactly the same. Like Lady Gaga, she had about the most fans on Facebook. Nonetheless, she, she founded her own network because it was made for, for that relationship. And what we want to do is we want to create more and more of those universes between fans and artists, but leverage it all over every artist. We think that there's a, an enormous need, both on the fan side and on the artist side, to, to find your your dedicated home to, to, to just to engage with, with the artist you like. And so, um, of course, it, it requires quite, quite a lot of work on the aggregation front. And, uh, you know, what do you find are maybe the hardest platforms to aggregate from uh, to create a channel of this kind? I think it's not the aggregation itself. It's, uh, it's the relevance, again, uh, to, to find all that semantic web and, uh, and to dig deeper and deeper and then provide a very nice user interface that uh, it makes it easy for you to efficiently uh, access what, what you're really looking for. Like, like. And uh, talking about, of course, artists are very important to the equation, so getting them on board is, is really important. So are you, are, you talking, are you targeting labels or managers, or what's your approach on that front? Um, actually talking to everyone who, who's interested. And, and the funny part is that we, we started, obviously, to give interviews explaining what we're going to do, what we're going to do and that in a second step we, we'd like to have active artists that engage directly to their fans. And our, on the, our original plans uh, sounded like let's do it in 2014, 15, but musicians started to, to approach it already and, and they want to have active profiles, they want to have some, some kind of tools to access directly their fans. And that's why we start to create it right now. And uh, we talk to both, we talk to artists, we talk to some indie labels, but we already have some, some universal guys uh, that are very interested and uh, that are already providing us with some in background information and, and connections. Yeah, sure. And um, so how do you feel like um, fans can best consume content like this? Of course, the, consu the consumer is the second part of the equation to this. So do you, do you feel like it's a mobile app play? Uh, is it an integration through notifications or of some sort? Uh, how, how do you best keep people updated on what's happening? So in, in the midterm, it, it is for me a mobile application. It is exactly the situation when you sit on your couch and, and you, you're watching that video of David Hasselhoff and you just want to see what, what he's doing nowadays. So you take off your phone. It's, it's habit creation for us. You don't have to think about what, what you actually eat. You know, if, if I asked you, tell me something about the history of, of Italy, you, you might go to Wikipedia directly. Uh, and we want people to go directly to Endormi and check what is happening around David Hasselhoff. Uh, and this is a mobile application for me. It's to kill some time when you're in public transportation. It's to, to to be used on the couch. But today we use a website because you can iterate much quicker. We want to learn a lot about the behavior, a lot about the market. And if I, if I had to go through the approval process of an app store, and uh, if I had to, to you know, create that mobile application over and over again, that would take much too long. So this is why we start that early phase with a website that might be optimized for mobile pages as soon as possible. But uh, if I had to bet, I would say in two years, we have no website anymore, but a lot of really good applications that run directly on the TV, maybe, and on your mobile devices. Sure. And, uh, of course, you talked about live as, as, a, as a big uh, part of, uh, of the need for an application like this and also to keep up to date with what's happening. I mean, uh, it often happens to me that I've, I've, there's like a, maybe like a rough trade, you know, special show or something uh, in Brick Lane that I, that I miss. And so well, the, the live side is interesting because there are other companies that operate in that sector. Uh, do, do you feel like it's more an integration play? And how, how do you plan on getting the data on, on, on the live side from, directly from Facebook, maybe, or for, for, from the artists themselves? Yeah, wherever it comes from. So uh, we want to be an aggregator. And if we find a service that is much better in, or it's already really established and knows exactly what he's doing, um, there's no reason to develop it ourselves. What we do is we just get the traffic, we find the relevant people, and we, we hand it over to the guy that knows already what to do with it. Yeah. Ticketing is a perfect approach, so why should I start known ticketing service if there's already Ticketmaster? Uh, but what I can do is I can find that specific fan that is around Seattle who wants to see a certain band, and I can put him right through to Ticketmaster and, and buy this ticket. Yeah. And this is the same for, for life for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much. And uh, I would encourage uh, listeners of DMT to go and check out endor.me. Uh, and uh, see what the site is all about, and check out some of the artists. And if uh, you're an artist yourself, is there any way that you, they can get, in, get on the platform? Is it automatic? Or? Yeah, we do have a landing page. So uh, drop us a line, and we are really looking forward to, to your feedback, and we'd like to, to develop more and more tools together with you. And, and this is what we do on a, on a weekly basis today. And uh, yeah, we're happy to, to, to get feedback from the industry directly. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. 
like uh, Future Music Camp uh, with uh, Ulysses uh, Hupauf uh, from uh, the uh, artist uh, management company Odyssey Music Network. Uh, so hi Ulysses and it's great to have you on. How's it going? Thank you. Very good. Thanks for having me. Uh, so let's talk about Odyssey Music. Uh, so when did you set up the company and, and how, did, how did it all start out? I worked for Universal and for Sony for a little bit more than 10 years and then um, I decided to go my own way and I started up a management company to manage artists, mainly Apocalyptica in the beginning um, and from that I transformed the company into more of a service independent music service company where I have several elements which can always serve the artists we represent in management better. That's what Odyssey is. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, so some of the, one of the things that we talked about on the show quite a bit is the ch evolving role of management and management becoming a hub for the artist, uh, uh, providing a lot of services that maybe labels are not willing or able to provide anymore. Also, as certain things become more relevant, like social media and uh, you know, um, direct fan and that kind of stuff. Uh, so how, how, do you, how do you take that, that and uh, how can you evolve as management to, to be able to serve all these things without going crazy basically because you know, it's, it's a lot of things to take care of. Well I think that management completely changed in the last 10 years uh, from being the spokesperson for a band and the label will do the decision and delivers all the service to basically the center of making the decisions and sometimes you know, even need to fund findings for uh, fundings for it and um, run campaigns and have a master plan there while no one else would develop one. So yep. all of a sudden, I think management is in the role that um, they have to they have to create artist careers, find the right people for it and not rely on any of the others to do so, but do it yourself. Yeah. And what do you think, uh, another type of company that's sort of sp springing up in the last few years, which is uh, taking a good ro uh, an important role, especially as management has to off offlay some of their, their responsibility as well, is labor relations services as well, which uh, can manage anything from uh, you know, a pledge campaign to, uh, you know, to take on some of the sort of load of, uh, of uh, managers, for example. So do you think that's a useful tool for, for you, or would you rather it be more centralized? Mm, well. In one way, I think that's exactly what we offer. We, ha we have, you know, uh, everything built around artist management, but then we offer label services okay. to release records and market those records. We do that with other independent artists, which we don't represent in management. We do it for international labels, for GSA or for mainland Europe. Um, we have a consulting unit where we have things like Pledge, well, while we just meet here. Um, we represent Pledge, do a lot of work for Pledge, which helps our artists as well. Um, we have a publishing unit, which works with Universal, which, you know, know delivers a lot of the publishing assets to it so we have a, a, um, a producer management side of things where we have access to studios and producers for it so th that's ex kind of exactly the system and idea what we're having yeah, yeah of course and uh, looking at the sort of German music music scene um, of course if you look at the stats in Germany a physical is still very very important and so uh, uh, but that's uh, in a way a, a little bit problematic especially if you have a campaign where you want to that you want to bring more independently and without you know the aids of of, of major labels. Uh, so, uh, what are the tools here in Germany for for an independent artist, for example, to distribute a physical record in an effective way that so that they can still make money off it? True. On one hand, very luckily, physical is very strong still yeah. in Germany. There's a great infrastructure on distribution and especially on on um, shops to sell music. Um, we have a good infrastructure of independent distribution companies. Um, major distribution companies also opened up more for indies to come in to do distribution for them. So the old saying that the major record label controls distribution, it's not true anymore. We, we see more and more that big independent artists go with independent distribution and ha are as successful, sometimes even su more successful than they were when they were with, with uh, majors. But they play a role and the majors play a role there because the distribution systems they have are very, very strong and valid. Yeah, and uh, in, in Germany w we're seeing loads and loads of new um, streaming services come in into the last, in the last 12 months. I think there's now seven or eight different companies that are operating. I'm hearing rumors that there's an, a new service in the works and it's, 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 it's a bit overwhelming really and we know that not all these companies are going to last. So w what's your take as a manager uh, when you see all these streaming services and also like not so great revenues coming yet from them? Personally, I, I tried a few streaming services. I use Spotify every day. That's, that's my source. Um, knowing that 
at least I do something legal. Um, not that I anyway illegally used it, but I do something legal there, but I know that it doesn't make any money. Um, I think it is the future. I think the model isn't there yet. And I think so many open up in Germany because it's not decided who's the market leader yet. Um, there are some some of them who become the you know the bigger players and more inf uh, influential but when you see stats streaming in germany is two percent of the whole market it's next to nothing basically and um we're having bands we have a band from sweden called royal republic um where we started in sweden with a band and they had a platinum record in sweden um a big success on radio with that record as yeah. well um, and i see as a manager it doesn't build any fan base. Um, they go to Stockholm to tour and there will be f hardly 400, 500 people on the back of a platinum record. While in Germany, without streaming services by that time when we when we did that song, um, and more or less the traditional way to market it, um, we're now selling two to 4,000 tickets a night. Yeah. So with that, my biggest fear with streaming only is that the whole fan connection disappears because people will only go for a song that's the whole setup and idea of a streaming service yeah, yeah exactly and that's i guess that's why spotify i mean i had a chat with the labor relations of spotify uh, last week i think uh, and they they're really pushing the artist uh, pages mm -hmm. feature now so that artists can try and connect with the audience a bit more because because yeah. uh, that's important to them that, that it happens and, uh, and finally you know there's going to be a session in, in about five minutes here uh, on on gema and you know of course it's a big controversy here in germany uh, because on the one side of course nobody's criticizing gema for trying to get higher fees from youtube because uh, of course youtube is not paying a, a lot to artists uh, at the moment unless you're having a big hit uh, but uh, on the other side of course it's a huge inconvenience for artists that are here in germany not to be able to monetize on the content that they have on the platform or not even to have it accessible so what, what, what are your feelings as a manager on that it's a dilemma yeah um, I I hate I use YouTube as well uh, we don't even have Vivo here because of the same problem um, so YouTube is the source and it's absolutely inconvenient because you can't see it we even have problems from our office to you know representing international bands to organize YouTube for those bands because we don't have real access it's absolutely dreadful. On the other side, I think Gemma is doing the right thing yeah. because it can't be the way that there is a unit of content like an artist is or like a label is who delivers that content to a massive platform uh, and the platform makes money with it and the platform decides what the business model is with it because you have no chance to negotiate any kind of a business model with them you just need to deliver it you need to do the work yeah. and then you can get a share of what you own um, that's not the right approach yeah, sure. So we'll see what happens in the next few months. It's yeah. gonna be it's gonna be interesting. Cool, great. Well, uh, uh, can you plug, do you want to plug your website and and uh, just so that people can check out uh, the company and the bands that you manage as well? Absolutely. Go to www.odyssey-music.net. Oh, this great. is where you find everything. Uh, great. I'm sorry. I just wanted to also add uh, any campaign or bands that people should be checking out uh, that you're working on at the moment. Well, we're working on some amazing pledge music campaigns. Um, Go, everyone should definitely check out Pledge Music because it's, it's such an amazing system. While we mainly work for German Pledge Music campaigns, on an international approach you find domestic campaigns on the side all, all the time. Go find that, see that. It's absolute fun to follow it and be part of that thing. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter. 